Yeah, hi everyone. Um, excited to present you today, uh, day one of the CCAI Summer School, uh, day uh, five, sorry, of the CCAI Summer School 2023. Um, today we're going to talk about AI for agriculture, forestry, uh, and other uh, land use. Um, this event is supported by CIFA, uh, Mila, Volkswagen, and Wallsphere.ai. I'm going to tell you a few words about uh, Climate Change AI. Uh, it's a uh, global nonprofit that catalyzes impactful work at the intersection of climate change and machine learning. Um, so you can have a lot of information about what we do uh, at uh, climatechange.ai. You can follow us uh, on Twitter at uh, Climate Change AI. And you can also access to our community platform, uh, which is accessible on our website as well, where you have a lot of discussion around climate change and application of AI. Um, and uh, you can reach out with all our uh, community as well. Um, you can also register to our newsletter where we share a lot of information about uh, like latest papers or uh, different job uh, opportunities and so on. Um, so for this talk today, um, we are going to ask you uh, to, to ask your question on the community platform. So if you have not registered yet, please register uh, on this platform. You can ask the question on the lecture Q&A channel uh, on the CCAI community platform, of course. And yeah, it's because you are a lot of, particip of, of participants, so we might not have enough time to ask all the questions. Uh, so please, you can uh, upvote or like the questions that you, you, you find them um, relevant, and it will give them a higher chance uh, of being asked. Uh, so you can ask this question, as I said, in the, the lecture Q&A um, uh, channel. And all the, uh, as a, uh, yeah, a detail I should mention is that all the, sorry, all the participants are required to uh, follow the CCAI code of conduct. And if there is any situation that is not uh, uh, compatible with this code of conduct, please send us a report reporting at uh, climatechange.ai. So our schedule for today, we will start uh, with a first talk from Anna Kerner uh, on AI for agriculture. We'll have a short break uh, if we have enough time. And then we'll have another talk from uh, David Dao about AI for forestry and other land use. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm really happy that today we have uh, Anna Kerner and she will talk about AI for agriculture. I will uh, briefly introduce her. So Anna is uh, currently an assistant professor in the School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence at Arizona State University. Her research focuses on developing machine learning systems for real world data and use cases. Uh, this includes remote sensing and spatial data sets, fairness, scientific discovery and exploration, agriculture and food security and other topics. Uh, she's an AI machine learning lead for NASA Everest and uh, NASA ACRES, as well as uh, center faculty for uh, the ASU Center of, uh, for Global Discovery and Conservation Science. And she was recognized on the Forbes 30 and the 30 list uh, in science in 2021. Uh, so thank you, Anna, for being here today. And I, uh, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Arthur. We'll get started here. Um, so I'm very happy to be here to share with you all uh, some information about AI for agriculture. So my goal here is that uh, by the end of the lecture, you'll understand what some of the main areas of research or topic areas are within AI for agriculture, some of the different modalities or data sets that are used, um, some example solutions to these kind of core problems that we'll be talking about, 
and have some, some resources both through the references in this lecture, but also the study materials that have been provided alongside the lecture so that you are able to get started working yourself on some of these topics if you're inspired to do so by this talk. So um, the driving focus for, for why we're interested in uh, looking at agriculture with AI or, or studying agriculture with AI and why we're talking about agriculture in this climate change AI summer school is that food security is one of the most pressing issues that we face in the world today. Um, and this issue is becoming increasingly important uh, as the climate is changing, as the, the climate is warming, we have more extreme weather events, uh, more frequent and se severe events, and the patterns of these events are changing. So our food system, and particularly some regions' food systems in the world, are extremely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And so agriculture is an area that's both you know, one of the most vulnerable sectors to climate change, but also one of the greatest uh, impactors of climate change. So it's also influencing, um, it, it's, we're, we're looking both at mitigation um, and adaptation, but also how we can change agricultural practices to be more sustainable um, and, um, and resilient. So, uh, a major goal is to develop more robust and scalable measures for monitoring the world's crops in a timely and transparent manner, but also trying to see how can we uh, adapt agriculture uh, to mitigate climate change uh, in the world. So if we're trying to monitor these crops and get information about agriculture and food security, who are the recipients of that information? Who wants to know about agriculture and food security? So in other words, who might some end users or decision makers might be? So um, there is a, a poll in a Google form in the community platform that I think um, Arthur might have shared now. So we can get your thoughts on who these end users or decision makers who want to know information about agriculture and food security from an AI system might be. Arthur, are you getting any of those results coming in? I don't have any answers for the moment. No results yet. Okay, so maybe let's hear from our TAs, <laughs> Bernard and Arthur. Who do you guys think might want to know some of this information about agriculture, food security? Uh, okay, so we, we, we do have a few answers for the moment. Can you our see them? TAs are saved. Yeah, can we see them? I don't see them. You'd have to share your screen, yeah. Oh, I thought I was, I'm sorry. I thought I was sharing. Okay, I'm going to share it. Oh, okay. All right, so we see a lot of farmers, farmers, policymakers, governments, agriculturalists, agriculture ministers, the public. Um, Exactly. These are all exactly right. Um, and so, all right, then I will switch over here. I think two key end users or, or stakeholders in this information that we see in this poll are, um, are farmers and policymakers so, or people in government. So people who are growing the crops and want to grow more crops, they're you know, really the drivers of this whole system. And the policymakers or um, individuals in government who can make decisions that impact how all of us are impacted by agriculture. Uh, so, what are some things that farmers might want to know? Again, we can go to the polls. What questions might farmers have, or, or what kinds of decisions might they need to make that could be? supported with, uh, with AI systems. 
that are monitoring agriculture. And I'll stop sharing so Arthur can bring us to the poll again. Again, the question is what questions might farmers have or what might farmers want to know? How to mitigate waste. Okay, so I'm I'm guessing what that means or what the 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 person who entered that means is like wasting inputs. So how to mitigate waste of irrigation or fertilizer. So how do we make sure that we're not using more water than is needed or applying more nitrogen than is needed? What are the weather patterns? So is there going to be a drought? What should be grown for a particular season? So farmers make decisions about um, what to grow each season based on a variety of factors. So based on their environment, but also food prices and how much they can sell things for, what there's a market for. Um, what's the health of their crops? How much is their field going to yield at the end of the season? Um, what's happened in history? Exactly. All of these are excellent answers. So let's go back to, um, to here. So this is something, uh, I think you guys got pretty much all of the things that are on my list. So one of those things was uh, the season or or when should the farmer plant? So typically farmers are planting on uh, a growing season schedule that has been used for you know probably hundreds of years. But uh, as climate change is impacting, you know, for example, when rains arrive, so often those schedules are based on um, for rain fed crops when the rains typically arrive. Um, and so in Kenya, for example, We've seen not only intense drought in recent years, but changes in the arrival times of those of the rainy season. So if farmers have been planting according to the historical rainy season, but now that season might be starting with a very large variance in time, knowing what the forecasted rains are very accurately for the season could help farmers decide when to plant so that they're not planting, for example, too early and then the rains don't come for a very long time and all of the crops um, don't make it. So that's a, a big question. What the performance of crops will be. So um, how crops are performing, are they healthy? Are they yielding a lot? What might threats be to their production? So if an area is experiencing lots of changes, for example, um, to the climate or if there are pests uh, that are present nearby. So maybe there's not pests in a farmer's field yet, but if they know that certain pests are in nearby fields, that could be really helpful to know what to expect um, or how things should be treated. Uh, what's the moisture in the soil? So what are the soil conditions? Um, how much rainfall? Uh, what's the temperature? All of these things that affect how crops will grow. Um, what the potential productivity is. So um, even, you know, the yield gap. So how much are they producing or expected to produce versus how much could you potentially produce in that area that you're in? Um, maybe if certain changes were made or if you used a different crop or, or used a different practice or something like that. Um, crop suitability. So somebody also mentioned in the responses what to plant. So maybe a farmer has been planting certain things because there's a market for it or because it's what's available or, or what's been planted for a long time there, but maybe a different crop or variety might grow better. Or maybe uh, on the flip side, maybe a farmer is wondering, hey, I think there's a big market for this particular crop, but would that be a suitable crop for my area? Um, and so that is something that we can also figure out um, with AI systems and various data sets at our, um, uh, that are available. So policymakers, this is, I'm generally referring to this as decision makers in government or different organizations who are coming up with the policies around um, how we respond to food security situations, how we um, produce food, all these different things. So 
policymakers want to know a lot of the same things. So how are crops performing? What threats might there be to production? Um, both potential and actual threats, you know, that, that are present right now, uh, when to intervene in these scenarios. So if there's a major drought that's continually happening and, and impacting crops, what can policymakers do in order to help a wide, uh, a, a, a very large community or their, um, their citizens to uh, become resilient to that? How to intervene? So what uh, different policies might have the most impact in an intervention? Um, what the potential productivity of crops could be? Again, what crops would be suitable there? How that suitability might change over time. So given the various climate change projections, um, something that's suitable now may not be suitable in the future, or something that's not suitable now may be suitable in the future. Um, and again, measuring potential impacts of these policies. So if we implement this policy, what might the outcomes be? Or if we already implemented policies, can we measure the impacts of those policies? So an example of this um, is from a project that we at NASA Harvest implemented a few years ago towards the beginning of, of COVID-19. This was around April 2020. So the, the government of Togo in West Africa was implementing a program to help farmers uh, cope with supply chain disruptions and, and other uh, shocks during the COVID-19 pandemic where they wanted to uh, distribute funds across voting districts based on the smallholder farmer population in each of those districts. So essentially wanted to know how should these funds be distributed across all these different districts based on or, or allocated to those based on how many smallholder farmers were in each of those areas. Um, but the problem was they didn't know um, what that smallholder population was in each district because the voting records or census records didn't fully capture all of these farmers who may not be reporting farming as their primary occupation. And so what they wanted to know from us was, could we use satellite data to map the distribution of smallholder farms that we could see in the images as a proxy for the population of smallholder farmers there? And they also wanted us to do this extremely quickly, you know, in just a matter of days or a week by Friday that week and with no label data. So probably, you know, you this might seem like an impossible task based on what you've learned about machine learning is we need data. So what do we do here? I'll talk about that in some later slides, some methods for that. But um, in this case, we were able to train a machine learning model to classify in the satellite data whether or not a location contained um, agriculture or a, an active farm or not and then provide that map to the Togolese government so that they could use that as a source of information in planning um, this new program. Another example is from a project we're currently working on, which is in Maui County in Hawaii in the US. These are um, a set of Pacific islands. And here we're working with uh, various end users like Maui United Way, farmers, the Maui County Department of Agriculture, the County Council and different community organizations to develop a dashboard for visualizing the state of agricultural conditions and how that influences food security in the area using the outputs of our AI systems um, that are processing satellite data in order to identify where certain crops are growing, how they're doing, what their conditions are, et cetera. And they can combine that information with other relevant data sets like food needs or nutrition needs that have been reported in the community, what food prices are, um, what where different grocery stores are, all these different layers that um, can be combined by the decision maker in order to figure out how to close these food security gaps in the county. Uh, so people often think of AI and agriculture as precision agriculture. You've probably seen like these visuals where it's like a farmer holding a phone that's like 
illuminating some information about their field, like some maps overlaid on their field. And there's like a drone nearby and there's a robot in the field too. You know, there's all this stuff happening where it's like, oh, we have this mechanized precision agriculture system going on. And certainly there is that. Um, so, you know, precision agriculture is really this kind of prescriptive uh, decision support of, you know, how can we precisely control the irrigation or um, always be kind of moderate, monitoring all these systems uh, through an AI system that is providing, um, uh, making decisions about, for example, how much nutrition to apply or how much of a different resource to apply. Um, and there are those on-farm systems, but we also have a huge amount of data from space. So we have hundreds of satellites orbiting the earth, really thousands, but hundreds of satellites that are imaging the earth all the time, imaging with different sensors, telling us all kinds of information about what's happening on the ground and even a little bit beneath the surface, all the way back to the 1970s. So we have over 50 years of this data that's just always being collected everywhere for free and, and at our disposal. And so this is an enormously beneficial data source um, for monitoring agriculture systems and uh, for building AI systems that really because of the size of this data, AI is not just uh, an optional tool, it's, it's a requirement. <laughs> we cannot process all of this data manually. Um, and so there's a huge amount of work in that area for agriculture and also for many other um, use cases that will be talked about in, in this climate change AI program. Um, so this, this figure gives kind of a, an overview of how all of these systems can come together. So we have satellites that are collecting uh, observations of the planet all the time. Those are being collected not just at one point in time, but you know, every five days, every day, depending on the satellite. So we have this stack in time of um, all of those different observations. And we can combine that uh, those data sources with ground truth field data that's collected by farmers, by field agents or, or agronomists who are going to collect data about the field, really ground truth annotators with um, sensors, you know, weather stations, all of these uh, on-ground sensors that can give us this ground truth information that basically give us the labels for our, our input data or our X uh, that is the satellite data. Because in the satellite data, I can't look at the satellite image and say, oh, that's maize growing there, or that's a healthy crop. You know, these things, we have to learn the patterns that indicate those, um, those classification or regression variables, because we can't see them with our eyes. And again, there's so much data that we can't do that manually. So um, we combine those data into our machine learning or deep learning models, and the outputs from those can we can use to create these different products, like uh, where crops are growing. So that's a crop land map, where certain types of crops are growing, which we call a crop type map, uh, what the yield is uh, at the field scale or at the county scale, at a regional scale, uh, crop conditions. Um, and we can um, also learn more about those conditions by combining those outputs with other data sources like what is the average temperature in the fields predicted to be maize? Or what's the average rainfall or the timing of rainfall in the fields predicted to be maize? So we can combine all of these things too. And we can do, again, even more downstream analysis for providing you know, direct information to farmers about you know, what yields might be, uh, diseases, all kinds of different things. And that information gets fed to policymakers and farmers to help inform their decision making. And really there should be another arrow that closes this all into a loop because as we all know, by now this is an iterative process. You know, we're constantly improving uh, these systems as they're deployed. So um, I'm gonna start by talking about these use cases of AI and agriculture that are using earth observation data, remote sensing data, 
from these satellites that I was just talking about. And then afterwards, we're going to talk about use cases that are uh, more proximal or on the ground. Um, so some key topics here that I'm going to be talking about in this section where this star is, is uh, topics at the intersection of AI, uh, agriculture and food security, AI, and remote sensing. And then, as I said, next we'll be in this other little triangle intersection, which is with um, more in situ sensors or proximal sensing. So the key areas of, of research and of work in AI for agriculture in this area are crop mapping, crop type mapping, field boundary delineation, yield estimation, and pest and disease detection. There are certainly other use cases like crop suitability or things like that, but these are the main categories which are going to contain almost all of the research that's being done in this area. Um, so this is this is by far you know the bulk of the work that's being done, and these problems translate directly to um, some of the the tasks or um, types of problems that you've learned about for machine learning in general. So when we're doing crop mapping, we're doing binary classification. When we're doing crop type mapping, we're doing multi class classification, or we can do you know one versus all binary classification. Um, when we're doing field boundary delineation, we're really talking about segmentation of images. When we're doing yield estimation, we're talking about regression. When we're doing pest and disease detection, usually we're talking about out of distribution or outlier detection. You could also set that up as classification, but typically, you know, these are rare occurrences. And so we frame it as an outlier problem. And all of these use cases present a lot of really interesting research challenges on the machine learning side in terms of um, domain adaptation, distribution shift being robust to distribution shifts, uh, how do we fuse data from uh, multi-fidelity data sources, learning from limited da labeled data, all kinds of really interesting challenges that are directly uh, informed or inspired by these use cases. So I'm going to go through each of these and provide one or two example uh, solutions for each. So for crop mapping, again, I said we're talking about binary classification of pixels as either crop or non-crop. So suppose we have uh, this, this uh, area, this is in China, um, containing some agricultural fields. This is a high resolution satellite image of that area. And so here, what we want to do to create a cropland map or a cropland classification is for every pixel in this area have a prediction of whether it is likely to contain cropland or not. And that gives us this binary map or a mask of where the cropland is. So I, um, I gave that example of, of a project where we were supporting decision making our policymakers in the West African country of Togo. Um, and there we needed to classify cropland in Togo, but with very little to no labeled examples in Togo of what, of what cropland looked like. So uh, the solution that we took here was to combine the very little data that we had in Togo with a large amount of data that we could obtain for crop or non-crop labels globally. Um, but because we wanted to give the model the context of, you know, these global examples might be useful for learning, but they're not as useful as examples that are actually within Togo for learning to classify pixels as crop or non-crop there. We created this, not just a, a, a standard LSTM or long short-term memory network, but we create an LSTM that has two classification heads. So essentially we set this up as a multitask learning problem where the model is simultaneously learning to classify examples from Togo and examples from anywhere else in the world. And so by learning from both of those tasks, the model is able to learn features uh, that are useful for classifying cropland in general, but are specialized towards the features that are useful for classifying cropland in Togo. And so we give that context of, of local versus global to the model, not just in this dual classification head, but in the loss function, which weights 
examples from uh, the global data set lower than examples from the local data set. So the model is essentially penalized more for getting examples in Togo wrong. And the input to that model is a 12 month time series of satellite observations from the Sentinel-2 satellite, which takes optical uh, images in different wavelengths of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum and the visible near infrared and short wave infrared, and also combines um, other satellite data, for example, about uh, from synthetic aperture radar, the Sentinel-1 satellite, um, or information from uh, about slope and elevation, which might be useful in identifying an area, whether an area has cropland or not. So we have these different features or, that are in our time series that go into this model and are classified uh, in order to predict whether each pixel based on its time series contains cropland or not. And then we can apply that trained model to every single pixel location in the entire country in order to form this map. And so that is what we would call a cropland map. And you can read more about that method in, in this paper reference here, and it's also in the study materials. Uh, in fact, all of these papers that are referenced in the slides, I think should also have a reference in the study materials. So crop type mapping is very similar, but in this case, we don't just wanna say, um, is it crop or non-crop? But which type of crop is it? So now it becomes a bi or a, a multi-class classification problem. So now we want to classify each pixel as one of n crop types. And so we could also frame that as a binary classification problem if we said we're going to, for example, in this case, say corn or maize versus not corn or maize, um, or soybean versus rest, or alfalfa versus rest. And we could combine those maps to form um, a, class, a, a map with multiple crop type classes. So that's generally how we would approach that problem. Whoops, sorry, some flickering on my slides. So um, one solution uh, is from this paper by Rose Rustowitz et al. Um, in 2019 that was doing uh, multi-crop classification in Ghana and in South Sudan. So um, to do this, they used, uh, they framed this as segmentation and used a uh, unit with uh, convolutional LSTM uh, units to classify time series of the spatial patches from the satellite data um, to output a multi-class classification map. So to output masks like this of uh, which types of crops were growing there. Um, and so you can see, um, it's, you can actually see here, I think how challenging it is to actually see things in these satellite images. And so that's why it's really important to have um, these models that can learn these relationships between uh, the satellite data and the targets we're trying to predict that are really not obvious to our eyes. Um, because often, again, we're looking at time series of this data which is, the, and in many spectral bands. So it's a lot of different dimensions of data that are hard for us to, to um, visualize. So um, this is a really powerful uh, use case for machine learning. So um, you can see here some different outputs from the compared models that are trying to predict these targets of the fields, uh, not just where those crops are located, but which type of crop is located there. And that's also a public data set that could be used as a benchmark for people developing new methods here. Um, another example for crop type mapping, I wanted to give an example of framing this as a binary classification problem. So again, often decision makers um, want to know about specific types of crops. For example, maize is a very important food security crop and also a very important commodity crop. And so we might want to make a maize versus rest map or just a maize map. Um, in this case for Hawaii, that project I mentioned as an example, we're really focused on, um, on cultural crops that are important staple crops for native Hawaiians in Maui County. And so taro is a very important crop there. It's also a very, uh, 
data sparse crop. So there, there might be a lot more training data for where maize is located in the world. There is basically no public data for where taro is. And so um, to do this, we're really in a few shot learning context where we're trying to learn from very few samples how to recognize a particular class in new data. So in this uh, case for, for our project in Maui, we're using a model that we recently published that you can read about in this paper here. Uh, the paper is called Lightweight Pre-trained Transformers for Remote Sensing Time Series, but that publishes a method called PRESTO, which trans, uh, stands for Pre-trained Remote Sensing Transformer. And that is a model that is pre-trained on uh, all these different satellite data sets, all this unlabeled data in a self-supervised way so that we can then use the encoder learned by that model to extract features that are useful for downstream tasks. So we, uh, we use this model that's been pre-trained on this global remote sensing data. We can just take that pre-trained model and we can use its features for a random forest or we add on another uh, kind of multi-layer perceptron classifier um, and we use that to train a model to identify taro versus not taro in the same satellite data, um, in, the, in the satellite data in Maui County. And using that, we're able to predict a map like this one here that is predicting where, where taro might be growing in the county. So um, another task that we talked about in AI for Agriculture using remote sensing is field boundary delineation. So um, this might also be called field boundary segmentation, um, but essentially what we're trying to do is instance segmentation for field or parcel boundaries. So the goal here is to, uh, based on the satellite images, be able to delineate or segment each individual field boundary in the image. And that seems like a much easier problem <laughs> than it really is uh, because there's lots of challenges in the size of fields globally. So some areas like the United States might have massive field sizes, whereas some other regions where smallholder farming is predominant, like Kenya, for example, um, has very small field sizes. So creating models that generalize across these systems is extremely difficult and is a very active area of research right now. So you can see this is exam an example of the ground truth field boundaries from a public data set of field boundaries in South Africa that's published on the Radiant Earth uh, Foundation Machine Learning Hub. So an example solution uh, for, for solving this problem was published by uh, Sherry Wang et al. in 2022 called Field Boundary Delineation Using Deep Transfer Learning and Weak Supervision. And so the, the two key points there are transfer learning and weak supervision. So what they did here was train a segmentation model. Uh, in this case, it's a fractal res unit, but it's, this essentially applies to any architecture you might use. So they trained the model on a region where the labels were very plentiful. So France is a region that uh, their government collects uh, annotations, ground truth annotations of field boundaries in every single field in all French territories, the whole country and territories, um, I believe every year. So this is a massive data set. There are millions of field instances in that data set. We have that nowhere else in the world. So this is a very high quality, huge data set that uh, in this paper they use to train the model to segment field boundaries there and then use that model as a starting point to transfer those weights to a different region and even a different satellite sensor of delineating field boundaries in India. So now using a smaller data set and a sparse label data set, so not every field in those images were labeled, they, um, they could fine tune the model to segment the field boundaries uh, in this new region in India. That's the transfer learning part of the title. Um, and the weak supervision part of the title is that uh, because these field labels are partial, 
you can't um, you can't compute the loss on the entire image patch in this example here because we don't have information about the label in all of these gray areas. So the weak supervision part is that you mask the loss to only be computed for the area of the image where you have a label. And so um, that was their solution. Oops, sorry. There's some some other information about the architecture, but again, our, like this is a, a strategy that can be applied to, to any architecture. Um, so that was a way to overcome the limitation of labeled data in some areas, which is very small, um, and also this challenge of partial labels in some areas. Another uh, use case was yield estimation. So in yield estimation, Again, this is a regression problem. Our goal is to estimate the uh, volume of crop or the, the weight, the amount of crop that will be harvested in each unit area. So this is, um, this is essentially a rate. Often people think of yield as what's really production. So they're like, oh, this area is going to produce um, a million tons of maize this year, but that would be production. So actually uh, yield is how much crop you're getting in each unit area. So um, it's you could think of that as a, a rate that you're estimating. So in order to estimate the production across a whole area, you would multiply that yield by the area. Um, so just to clarify that, which is sometimes a point of confusion, so this shows an example of what that might look like, where um, in this paper uh, by Jillian Daines et al. Um, in 2020, they predicted maize yields in the United States in every one of these pixel locations um, in terms of tons per hectare. So this can show you some areas that have really high yields and, uh, for maize and some areas that have lower yields. Um, so an example, another example paper that did this is uh, from a paper called Deep Gaussian Process for Crop Yield Prediction Based on Remote Sensing Data uh, by you et al. in 2017. And the goal here was to predict yield at a county scale. So not based on every individual pixel, but in each entire county of the U.S. So what would be the yield expected for each county using the remote sensing observations? And of course, if you were to use all of the pixels in an entire county, that would be an enormous input size, which is just not at all practical. And so what they did was use 3D histograms of the different remote sensing or satellite data spectral bands um, in order as the input there. So they use those 3D histograms and use that as the input to um, uh, implemented with a deep Gaussian process for estimating um, some uncertainties as well, using an LSTM architecture as well as a CNN architecture. And you can read more about that in the, the paper as well. So um, another area of uh, AI for agriculture and remote sensing or with remote sensing data is pest disease and hotspot detection. And so I actually include this not as an area where a lot of work is being done, but as uh, maybe a challenge or a, a hope to everybody that um, this is an area that can have a huge amount of progress from AI and remote sensing, but actually there's very little work being done in this area. So I include it because, um, you know, I a lot of work could be done there and, and people want to do work there, um, but it's really, there, there's not a huge amount of work being done yet. So this is um, just an example uh, from some work that we did. This is in partnership with Katie Gold at Cornell, uh, where they had some observations of downy mildew disease in vineyards that you can see here on the left in these kind of patchy areas. And on the right, you can see an anomaly score that is output by one of our models um, that is uh, an anomaly detection model, an unsupervised model to, um, to score how anomalous each pixel in here is with respect to the other pixels. So you can see that the bright areas have high anomaly scores 
um, which generally also correspond to these areas of disease incidence. And this is something, uh, this is a result that we obtained using uh, a library called Domain Agnostic Outlier Ranking Algorithms, or DORA, uh, that was also published by my group, where it takes input data in the form, could be satellite data, feature vectors, any, any kind of data, um, and extracts some features from that, or just passes those raw values to the models, and uses a variety of different uh, methods for ranking outliers or scoring outliers in an unsupervised way and visualizing those results for, for end users. So if you're interested in outlier detection, um, you could read more about that in that paper. But we'll talk more about where most of the disease detection work is done, which is on the ground, uh, in the next section. So that was this, this intersection here. Um, at the bottom with remote sensing. So now we're going to talk about some other use cases that are more down to earth on the ground using sensors or data sources that are on the ground, uh, not coming from, from space. So these areas overall, um, I would categorize into precision agriculture or resource optimization, robotic farming, yield estimation and optimization, um, but now from the ground perspective, uh, pest and disease identification, and livestock and rangeland management. So these are kind of the major areas uh, of, of research at that intersection. And again, all of these inspire uh, similar challenging uh, problems to work on in machine learning of domain adaptation, distribution shift, data fusion, um, few shot learning, all kinds of interesting challenges uh, using that data. So uh, you remember this figure where I talked about precision agriculture, where really the goal in precision agriculture is data-driven management of on-farm resources. So we're trying to, to create models that can manage our water resources, our nutrient resources, our equipment, et cetera, in a more efficient way that saves money or saves pollution, um, all kinds of benefits there. So one example of that is from this paper called Optimizing Nitrogen Management with Deep Reinforcement Learning and Crop Simulations. So in this paper, their goal was to use reinforcement learning to learn a policy for nitrogen application that would minimize the input of nitrogen and the leaching of the nitrogen into you know, the water and the environment without sacrificing yield. So this is a trade-off to the model. So we want to maximize yield. If you wanted to maximize yield, you would just apply a ton of nitrogen. And in fact, that's pretty much the policy that a lot of farmers do, is just over-fertilize. Um, but that's not good for the environment. So we want to balance that in this policy with a trade-off of um, minimizing those inputs and the leaching to the environment. So that's measured here in this table in terms of nitrogen input, nitrate leaching, um, and then nitrogen uptake uh, and the yield, uh, which is that top weight at maturity. And all of those are combined for the cumulative reward to the reinforcement learning model. So um, they train different management policies using a deep Q network and soft actor critic algorithms. Not going to go into that here, but you can read more about that in the paper. Um, and they, they, uh, created this gym environment for testing out these algorithms, so or testing out the different policies. So they created this gym DSSAT or gym DSAT um, environment where they use these actual crop simulations, uh, biophysical simulations to test these policies. Because obviously, to test these policies in in the real environment would require a lot of willing farmers and a lot of time. So they created this gym environment so they could evaluate those policies. And they were able to develop uh, reinforcement learning policies or learn policies that achieved higher or similar yields um, while using than the baseline while using less fertilizer for maize crops in, in their experiments in Iowa and Florida. So um, that is a way that we can use uh, AI, in this case, reinforcement learning, to learn policies for application of nutrients. Uh, robotic farming is another use case where um, 
We want to automate farming operations like seeding, harvesting, sorting, spraying. Um, so for example, in, uh, in this case here, there's a company, small robot company that um, is, is using this little robot named Tom <laughs> to you know, automatically spray weeds, for example, as it drives along. So it has this camera, sees weeds, but also crops and needs to differentiate between what is you know, a real seedling and what is a weed that needs to be sprayed. So their goal was to identify locations of weeds versus wheat crops in the field robot images for the application of precision spraying. And to do that in this paper, by saying it all, they trained student teacher models for semi-supervised object detection to identify those two classes of weeds or wheat. And then using this kind of trained model, these autonomous robots could uh, predict with high confidence which, which crops were weeds and which were the crops uh, and spray only those that are weeds. So we talked about yield estimation in the context of the remote sensing data of the field, but this could also be done based on sensor information that's on the ground. So maybe there are sensors in the fields that could be used for yield prediction. In this use case, this is for um, fruit counting. This is a popular application for um, AI, and, AI and agriculture on the ground. So in this case, um, UAVs and some other uh, in some other papers there might be tractors or other kinds of um, sensor carrying agents or camera agents and they are imaging these uh, citrus trees and um, segmentation models are used to automatically count um, all of the individual fruits and estimate the yield from these orchards. We talked again about disease from or hotspot detection from remote sensing data, but like I, I hinted before, the vast majority of this work, pretty much all of this work right now is done using imaging on the ground. So like cell phone cameras um, or other proximal cameras for, um, you know, for example, there's lots of apps for farmers to submit pictures of their crops and get information about what type of pest or disease is there and what treatment options might be. So in this paper, they present uh, an example of estimating the area of um, a cassava root that is um, that has root necrosis through this brown streak disease um, using segmentation models. Um, and finally, this is my last example here. Uh, an example of livestock and rangeland management, where the goal is to monitor and optimize animal behavior, health conditions, feeding patterns. There's also some work, for example, in like deciding where to move animals based on forage conditions. Um, but I thought this was a cool example to share from Song et al. Um, on automated body condition scoring of dairy cows using three-dimensional feature extraction from multiple body regions. So here their goal is to automatically assess the body condition of dairy cows um, for livestock. So they're trying to automatically detect, you know, if they're having some health issues or some injuries or, or what their conditions are. And so they um, computed these scores based on some expert features for dairy cows in real conditions and then extracted some vision-based features that they would use to estimate that body condition score um, using a machine learning model. And they did that in this case, not using a deep learning model, but using a one nearest neighbor or a K nearest neighbor, K equals two uh, classifier for body scores. So this is all exciting, lots of different uh, methods here. Um, and I think we don't have a lot of time. So I'm, I think I'm just going to skip the poll here and tell you <laughs> what are some of the challenges. So this is like the three stages of, of use inspired AI, where first we're learning about these real world impact that we can have with AI. We're seeing all these applications. We're like, this is awesome. I'm going to do this great work. We get some initial promises or some promising results on some clean data. Things are going great. We try to, to apply this to 
out of di out of distribution or unseen data, suddenly things are not going so well. <laughs> We're experiencing all of these challenges. We're trying to you know improve our models, make this work for these real data, so we can get back to that that happy face again. So, what are some of these challenges? Um, collecting ground truth data is extremely difficult. You know, I showed all of these things where we have to get the ground truth data to be our label for satellite uh, satellite data inputs and, and other models, but it's really expensive and time consuming to go out and get that data on the ground. So there's different, um, you know, it's a whole other area of research of how to more efficiently collect that data. Um, the real world does not look like ImageNet. The real world is very messy. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of challenges of dealing with that data quality, um, high interclass variance, lots of similarities between classes, multiple labels, um, kind of unclear labels in some scenario scenarios. The labels are changing year to year. Farmer might plant a crop one year, a different crop the next year. Um, Spatial and temporal generalization is extremely difficult for these models. So often we train a model on data from one region and it is it completely breaks in another region or we train it on one set of years and on unseen data from a new year, it totally breaks. So these models can be very brittle. And so um, robustness of these models to new data is an active area of research. Um, there, this is, starting to, um, to be addressed by a lot of different uh, new initiatives, but it's, it can be very difficult to find open data or open code for reproducing results, reusing previous work and benchmarking new methods um, against common data sets. Deploying ML models is just hard. There's a, this is a widespread challenge that actually deploying systems successfully is very difficult. Um, these projects involve a lot of end user communication and, um, you know, we spend a lot of time, you can see some of my colleagues here talking with a farmer in Maui, we spend so much time talking with the stakeholders at every stage of the process to make sure these systems are, um, are performant and useful. And finally, um, this kind of goes along with the generalization point, but geographic distribution shift uh, is a big challenge. There's a huge disparity in performance of these models across different geographies. They might perform very well in data-rich or resource-rich regions like the United States or Europe, but in other regions like Sub-Saharan Africa, which are extremely important for um, creating methods that are uh, accurate for monitoring food security in the context of climate change, one of those vulnerable regions to climate change, they don't work as well at all. So with all those challenges, I wanted to leave on a high note of the kind of impact that we can have when we work through these challenges and we try to create new solutions that can solve these problems that um, with this quote from Sheena Lawson, the minister that we worked with in Togo for the, the project I mentioned in the beginning, she said, this map provides unmatched clarity into the nature and distribution of agricultural land nationwide and helps provide decisive knowledge being used to design social protection policies aimed at improving the livelihoods of agrarian rural communities. So thank you for your attention. I hope you learned all about AI for agriculture and maybe we have time for a couple of short questions. Thank you, Anna, for your great talk. It was really interesting. Uh, we had a lot of questions, actually. Uh, uh, so, so, yeah, we, I, I will start with, with the first one. Of course, we won't have the time to, to go through all of them. Uh, the first one is um, about uh, AI systems require significant monetary investments in hardware and software, as well as training and support. This can be a significant barrier for small-scale farmers who often have limited resources. How can we mitigate this in low-income countries? That's a great question. So typically what we're trying to do is actually work with local organizations that can be sort of a, a middle person or um, a hub for working with those farmers or delivering information to the farmers. So we wouldn't necessarily be training like individual farmers, which is really not scalable um, to use the outputs from these systems. We're trying to create systems and work with um, community organizations that can be kind of hubs 
and use those systems and information and distribute that to farmers in a way that is most useful for them. So that's typically the approach that we take. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, another question is uh, how to ensure the products and dashboard uh, are user friendly and convenient to use for farmer? How can we measure, measure its impact? Another great question. So what we should do is probably work with UI UX designers and you know, people who are experts in this kind of thing. Um, what we often do is try to, for any of these stakeholders or any of the products we're developing, we're working with the stakeholder from the beginning and closely throughout the process so that we don't develop this whole system and show it to them and they're like, what's this? I don't get it. We, we show them you know, results as we're creating them, get feedback on that and how it's presented and try to make those improvements and adjustments um, iteratively. Okay, thank you. Uh, we might have time for uh, a last one, maybe. Uh, are there any public access satellite data sources that you would recommend? Yes. So uh, probably the easiest way to see all of the public satellite data sources in terms of um, just the data, so not the labels, would be if you look at the Google Earth Engine catalog. And I also put a lot of resources about this kind of thing as well in um, in the the resources, the study notes that are provided. Um, there's also some resources where you can find labeled data sets. So getting the, the labeled annotations that you can pair with those satellite data. So some, some major workhorse satellites would be like Sentinel-2, Landsat, Sentinel-1. Um, these are kind of the major ones that are free. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we, we have uh, a, a few time left, uh, actually. Oh, it's okay, David just joined. So thank you very much again, Anna, for uh, for your time and for this wonderful talk. Uh, all the questions, so there are a lot of remaining questions uh, on uh, on our community platform. So maybe we'll have time uh, later on to, to answer all of them. Um, so th thank you again for, for, uh, for this talk. Uh, I'm going to, to share my screen now. Thank you all. Sorry. And so, yeah, and now I will uh, introduce uh, the David for our second uh, talk about AI for forestry and other land use. And by the way, uh, I forgot, uh, I would like to, to thank Bernard for uh, his, his work on helping me uh, for this TF for, for this uh, lecture. Uh, so thank you a lot, David, for being here today. He's uh, the founder uh, of the nonprofit Game Forest and a uh, semi-finalist of the X-Price Rainforest, where he co-leads the ETH Zurich Plus Game Forest team. He received his PhD in ML systems from uh, ETH Zurich and was previously an engineering an engineer in Silicon Valley and a research fellow at Berkeley AI Research, Stanford University, and at Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. So thank you for being here today, and I, I leave you the floor. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen now, um, and let me know if you can see it. Yes, we can see it. Wonderful. Yes, I'm super, super excited to talk today. Um, at the CCI Summer School on Forests, Forests and Land Use. Um, my name is David Dahl, and I just want to start a little bit about myself and how I got into that topic. So I'm definitely not a forester, um, even though parts of my, my, much of my team is from the nonprofit, but I am, uh, as uh, Arturo said, an AI researcher who studied uh, ML systems. And many years ago, in the beginning of my PhD, I had um, participated in a hackathon at the United Nations Cup, where the, the question was basically how can machine learning and like technology uh, help us tackle climate change. And I learned about forests there. And back in the days, I was working on unsupervised learning algorithms that are, that are predicting for self-driving cars if a pedestrian can pass or not a street. And I realized that for the forests, when it comes to, for example, deforestation, the same algorithms can be used to predict potentially the spread of deforestation and many, many other things. So that's where I slowly moved into this field of um, using the skill sets I learned in computer science 
to apply to nature and forest. And the same year, I, I so that hackathon ended up with my team and I winning the grand prize with the idea called Gainforce that is exactly using satellite-based uh, data to predict and um, forecast deforestation, but also to pay out community members that pr uh, protect forests. And ever since that, uh, then this uh, small idea turned into a nonprofit gain forest that has uh, impacted the lives of many people around the world. Here's just a um, collage of pictures. So we are basically active in 27 organizations together with 27 partner organizations around the global south in Kenya, where we have wildlife camps stationed and record elephants crossing street. And uh, in Bhutan, where we are actually working with the government of Bhutan on protecting large parts of um, the grasslands and forests, as well as, of course, in the Philippines, where we work with most of the youth activists, uh, empowering them with drone data and uh, machine learning predictions to protect forests, but also to pay out the local community members. So this is where my motivation starts, and I'm really deeply uh, care about this topic. This is uh, this has been my life, life's calling, and so I want to share a little bit of that excitement to to you today in this lecture. Um, and this lecture will start the following way. So first, we'll talk about how the heck has forest to do anything with climate change, right? Forest and land use. What's the role between forest and land use and the climate crisis? Then we'll talk about how some methods of um, financing can be used to basically prevent the destruction of nature. And we will specifically talk about carbon credits and a payment for ecosystem services, PES. Finally, we will of course talk about artificial intelligence and how that can help and really play a role in this whole big picture of forest, nature and climate change. And lastly, we will end up with exploring some of these carbon credit projects and seeing, okay, you're playing basically the AI algorithm with yourself and seeing, okay, what, what can go wrong when we don't have transparency and don't have monitoring? And lastly, of course, um, questions and discussions. So let's get started. So climate change, forest and land use. I would like to, you to start with, because it's probably already late at day, you had a wonderful lecture on agriculture already, just to take a moment, step back, close your eyes and listen to the sounds of the forest. So it's not surprising if you feel like listening to the sounds of these forests makes you very calm and tranquil. And many of you might have, might imagine um, water, lakes, trees, mountains. Um, fun fact, um, if you ask what people, when they close their eyes, imagine and listen to these sounds, the answer to that highly depends on where this person comes from. If you ask people from Europe and North America what they imagine, they will say exactly that, like lakes, uh, trees, and mountains. And if you ask local community members what they see when they listen to these sounds, a very surprising answer for me, the first time I hear it is they see themselves, right? Like they see humans and communities in it. So that's, I think, a really important lesson to learn that the same sound is interpreted differently. But to really emphasize the point here, which is uh, the tranquil feeling, the well-being when you hear these sounds, that is not coincidental. We humans evolved with the forest, we evolved with nature. So nature is essential for human existence and the good of quality of life. And most of nature's contributions and um, that, are, that are helping us, they are not fully replaceable and some are irreplaceable. That is from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, one of the highest institutional science advisories of the United Nations. So basically, that's a given, right? And if you look why that is the case, like forests, nature itself, um, we talk a lot about it in terms of climate change, of course, in storing carbon, planting trees, where it sequesters the carbon from the atmosphere, and I'll tell you later how that works. But really, there's so much more on this. Nature itself 
actually we call these ecosystem services um, have four guiding pillars where we can we can roughly abstract the use of these ecosystems, which is supporting. It provides the habitat of like life and biodiversity for us, right, to like live in. Um, photosynthesis, soil formation, like creating like an environment that is livable, and food, of course, and permissioning like clean water, fish, wood, wood um, cool temperatures during during like a hot summer day, a forest, if you've noticed. It's regulating, it's purifying the water, it's cleaning the air. And the thing you just felt, it's cultural, right? It's aesthetic, it's recreational, it's um, very inspiring to be inside nature and forests. And that's a value, a contribution that, that is going so much more beyond that what we are currently focusing on when we talk about forests, which is storing carbon. But let's talk about carbon. How does the forest even store carbon, right? And so much of the carbon that is stored in a forest, we distinguish it between two things. Um, this, um, um, above ground biomass and below ground biomass. So when a tree grows, um, um, the, the bark itself is, um, consists of carbon itself. So the bigger and bigger, bigger it grows, the more it sequesters it from the atmosphere, the CO2 turns it into carbon and stores it in, in its uh, bark structure. But also it stores the carbon in its roots and that's where it's in the soil below ground um, biomass, that's what we call it. It's harder to measure than above because you, you can't really see the roots. You can only estimate the ratio between how tall a tree is from seeing it straight forward and how much roots and uh, how much biomass might be underneath the ground. But really uh, lots of the ground then basically stores much of the carbon is actually underneath in the soil. And if you look at wetlands, for example, um, especially these moisture like uh, wood um, nature areas store especially a lot of carbon in the soil. And the reason is because um, there's a lot of microorganisms and micro life itself, carbon is an essential component of life itself. So a lot of life, a lot of biomass is hidden inside these wetlands. Um, and if you look at, for example, the tropical forests that we mostly talk about, they store most of the above ground biomass because these trees are gigantic. They can be up to 120 meters high, but um, the soil usually is quite dry. So now the problem, um, so much carbon it's that it is storing that we talk about it as a carbon sink, like when you plant new trees, these regulates and um, um, sequester the carbon from the atmosphere. But when we burn these trees down, what turns into a carbon sink becomes a carbon bomb because all the CO2, all the carbon that is stored now in the bark and in the soil, if that dies off, um, it releases back into the atmosphere. And unfortunately, also from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform, the natural world, forests as we've seen it so far, they have been deteriorating in rates unparalleled in human history. We have lost half of the world's forests that have ever existed since uh, pre-industrial times. Um, and that is just a number that is uh, unfathomable. Um, and if you look at this, uh, one third of the world's forest is uh, created through expanding agricultural land, uh, grazing, crops, and so on. So this is one of the biggest drivers. 1% um, is through urban. And if you look at the decadal losses in global forests over the last three centuries, really it accelerated the most um, at the first half of the 20th century. And much of the loss we can see is in the tropical forest where most of the biomass above ground is stored. And one of the things you also notice in forests is when countries um, move into the development and GDP um, journey, Oftentimes they reforest their areas. So you can see it in the late 1990s and early 2000s that many of the temperate forests where the richer countries are lying in, they have been actually net gained since 1990s. And that is because of that economy of development that the moment you reach a certain kind of development, you'd start with caring more about nature and you're planting again. But as you can see, the tropical forests are reaching unprecedented limits. And Deforestation is so much so a driver of the climate crisis. Um, it is a surprising number every time I mention that to the audience. Um, many don't know, but like 18% of all global anthropogenic emissions um, 
are coming from deforestation, from tropical deforestation. Um, and if deforestation would be a country, like a, just a country that you compare with the emissions of other countries, it would be the third largest emitter right after China and the US. So basically, there's no way around the Paris Agreement protecting us from 1.5 if we cannot stop deforestation within this decade. Um, this is just science. And it's it's very scary because it is it is such a huge driver of um, unfortunately the economy and the developed country that it's really hard to stop, but it's also such a huge driver for the climate crisis. And that is again because uh, at a certain level the forest is not growing anymore. It's, it reaches an intact stable state where the, the photosynthesis and the above ground respiration when the forest basically breathes out the CO2 again is at an equilibrium. So when you not only, you don't even have to cut down the forest, right? When you deforest the area, the whole biomass, uh, everything goes back into the atmosphere. But just when the forest is slowly dying, right? Like droughts, edge effects, logging, fire, that already causes a net effect into the atmosphere, emission effect, and that contributes heavily into um, the climate crisis. So we're talking here about really deforestation, which is a clear cut, and forest degradation, which is like basically um, a dying, dying nature forest that also slowly emits more and more emissions. So I hope you listen carefully. <laughs> and a uh, quick quiz to you. Um, from these five images, what do you think? So these are all showing satellite pictures of different drivers of forest loss. Um, a, B, C, D, and E. And hopefully a poll should come up now that uh, you have to sort what is which driver. And uh, let's see if you can, if you get it right. In the meantime, I'm stop sharing because I noticed you couldn't hear the sound before. Uh, I just hope you just imagined the, the birds and the nature then. I'll stop sharing and I'll try to reshare with sound. So now sound should be shared. Um, we're we starting having some answers to your, your poll. Do you want me to share uh, the answers? Yeah, sure. I'm sharing my screen, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see it. I can't see it, unfortunately. Oh, OK. So we have um, um, around 50, like 48% for A, 40% for B. 10% uh, for E, so, oh, it, it's moving because we are receiving uh, uh, responses, but most of the, uh, uh, half of the answers are from A, uh, a third are from B, and the other are between E and, and, uh, and C. That is really, really great because that's exactly uh, what I wanted to show. Um, so let me go through each of them quickly. Yeah. Um, so the first one is deforestation, clear cutting um, for cattle, for example. This is what you see in the Amazon uh, when you look at the satellite picture. What you see here is um, potentially a cattle farm where people cut large parts of the forest so their cattle, the beef industry, can just eat the grass that is underneath. And that is responsible for 27% of all deforestation. So uh, definitely you're right if that's uh, your vote that this is the highest. Um, the forest loss driver, but the next ones, urbanization, creating cities, and that only costs for 1% of um, deforestation. So really the cities itself is a marginal impact compared to the next ones with the shifting agriculture. It's a certain kind of agricultural practice where you basically cut and move around. And forest products, this one, for example, is a, a eucalyptus plantation. Um, which is also cutting down like natural habitats. And you're basically planting something that is 
unnatural, which we don't count as a forest anymore. For example, palm oil in Indonesia is a very classic example there. Um, you're basically destroying the whole forest. And the last one, large, large, large part, and you've seen it in the news in Canada um, last month, is wildfires. 23% of all forest loss is attributed to annual wildfires. And this is actually a really urgent problem, as we believe that wildfires are going to um, increase by several magnitudes due to climate change. So the last point before moving on to the nature finance is that the climate crisis is deeply linked to nature, and so is a natural crisis deeply linked to the climate crisis. Besides us experiencing in increasingly hot temperatures, global warming, and its associated catastrophes, um, we are also losing 100 species every day. Um, species in the sense of actual genetically diverse um, animals and plants that maybe have not been even detected before. And you can see, for example, this graph here with the famous stripes showing um, the increase of temperature over uh, since uh, pre-industrial times. And you can also see the um, loss of green as the opposite effect on biodiversity. So basically, this is the richness of life uh, in pre-industrial times, and you see more and more vanishing. Those two are interlinked. We call it sometimes also the twin crisis um, of the environment. So it's very, very difficult to look at one without looking at the other. Deforestation is really changing our climate, harming the people in the natural world. So we really must, and we can reverse this trend. And there are certain kind of things we can do. We can plant a trillion trees. So there's um, research that's shown that our planet still has a trillion trees reforestation potential that could potentially sequester up to 10% of our emissions cuts needed for 1.5. Um, but yeah, the question is, how can we finance that? And that will be the chapter number two, finding some nature's calm credits and payments for ecosystem services. So the most popular one you've probably heard about is forest carbon credits. And that is also the one that will be the focus on introducing you on this mechanism, because I think it's a very interesting one uh, in certain sense of trying to uh, put a price on carbon and therefore trying to protect nature. And what are the certain kind of like building blocks required to do so? So when we talk about forest carbon credits, there are three different types of it. There's reforestation, planting trees, right? We have an estimated impact of 15 tons of CO2 per hectare per year um, if you plant young trees. And as they grow, you know, they just uh, sequester more and more carbon. So it, um, it adds to the, um, to the balance sheet. Then you have avoided deforestation. Basically, you can say, well, I prevented carbon from actual going into the atmosphere, so I should receive a credit or some kind of offset for that, right? So this is basically when the forest is not growing anymore, and you can estimate to have an impact of 400 tons of CO2 per hectare for every, because that's roughly how much you would emit into the atmosphere when you cut it. Um, and then there's something in between, which is called improved forest management. This is basically trying to preserve middle aged trees so you don't cut them like too fast, so they store longer time carbon. Um, and there are some people, some companies that are also trying to calculate the credit out of that. And so how this, how this really behaves in a certain sense is sure the common credits on the forest side are currently the biggest, uh, most prominent, I wouldn't say biggest, are the most prominent financing method for nature. But they are not the only ones. So there are three others that I just wanted to show for the holistic picture of financing for nature. So you're not all moving to the calm credit market after this lecture and saying, okay, this is, uh, David told me, this is where the money is. No, no, no. So there are certain kind of other alternative financing for nature. And that's really important to mention. So there's payment for ecosystem services. You don't have to pay just for carbon. You can pay, for example, when the landowner is just managing the land well with different kinds of KPIs, like biodiversity, like just finding the right uh, like education of local communities. The challenge here is, of course, um, so Costa Rica is a very prominent example of doing this. They have a payment for ecosystem service that doesn't rely on carbon, but on the overall holistic protection of nature. But there, the challenge is finding the right like KPIs, the monitoring, the land rights, who owns the land. That's super difficult. Then there's agroforestry, making sure that 
your forest is uh, also providing some potential like forest products for you to sell. But here, the problem is that um, oftentimes these communities lack market access and creating a really sustainable agroforestry business requires extensive domain knowledge. And lastly, ecotourism, a very popular form of tourism that basically focuses on the conversation, conservation of nature and the well-being of local people, like a fancy luxury retreat in, in a rice field in Bali, for example. But then here, the challenge is how can I make sure that it's not overused and that the local committee members are actually getting a share of that, of that tourism and not just the hotel owner. Right. So each of these alternative financing methods have their own challenges to talk about. But let's talk about the monitoring part, because that is so essential, so important to the forest carbon credits and also to the ecosystem payments. And here, really, the key point I want to uh, want you to get away with today is that we cannot value what we cannot measure. And monitoring, reporting, and verification, MRV in the technical terms, is a key element for uh, these communities to receive money. And the reason is that oftentimes, in order to release a credit or for an institutional funder to fund you, there's a certain kind of set of protocols, standards that needs to be measured in order for them to release it from the balance sheet, right? It's just regulatorily defined like this. So how it's currently done, and you can slowly see where AI could potentially play a role, is when you have a forest carbon credit project, or when you protect forests and you want to access these finances, you have to walk into the forest um, and you have to determine what we just discussed, how much carbon is actually stored in that forest. And the way you determine it is currently you measure every single tree or a sample of it, to, um, and then you extrapolate. And so basically you hack a tree with a, with a diameter um, extract the diameter, estimate the height of it. And then from that, there's a certain kind of equation you can plug it in that gives you the above ground biomass in kilograms. And then uh, half of that is the CO2. That's roughly the calculation we usually do. And this is super expensive. So just doing one hectare of monitoring requires 300 US dollars. And you can imagine how this already prevents smallholder uh, farmers from even accessing that. That is like a lot of money for people in the developing world. And even worse, um, they are so important that much of the public funds that are reserved for come credits or for ecosystem payment services, they oftentimes are not released because uh, the MRV process is too slow. Um, it, the, the projects cannot basically claim what they protect. There's not enough trust. At the same time, this has a really detrimental effect on the communities and the projects itself, because if you don't get any funds and they're inaccessible to the local communities, why would you protect the forest? So there's an example of Indonesia, for example, I think, was it, that applied for Red Plus funding, which is a, which is a um, globally United Nations like uh, set up fund. And they uh, it took it took them several, I think, almost a decade for them from the moment they applied to receive the funds to actually receiving the funds. So the question is, as a community member, would you would you work for a job where you don't know if you even get paid in ten years, right? Like, and the obvious answer is no. So, forest camp projects um, have five really important components. First is verification: how much carbon is actually stored in that. So that's the first step. But that's not the only thing. So let's say you have a, a banana tree, Musakea, and you measure the diameter at press height, which is, okay, this is, uh, at press height, this is how big the tree is. You measure the diameter. Then you plug this in, this number, for example, 0.21 meters, into a fixed equation called an allometric equation um, that has some kind of fixed parameters that uh, someone determined back in the days. And you extract the biomass out of that. That is basically how you calculate very uh, up to state of the art um, how much carbon is stored in a single tree. And then you have something else you have to consider, which is permanence. Okay, how long is that tree gonna stand, right? Like, is it, am I assuming that this tree is gonna stand for like two years, for like 10 years, for 100 years? And believe it or not, every carbon credit that someone sells, 
it's an implicit promise that this tree, this hectare forest that they just sold you to, that you offset it, is standing 100 years, which is unfathomable to even control for it. But this is the actual current like standard assumption. And then here, another quiz for you. This is called, and this is one of the things where most of the cheating will happen in carbon credits called additionality. How important was this area to begin with to be protected? For example, how, how at risk was this area, right? At what at risk of deforestation in the first place? And that really changes the game of how much credits you can get. For example, someone who claims he protected 100 hectares of forest in the middle of the Amazon is probably not as important as something very close by. So quick quiz for you, um, A, B, or C, what do you think is, um, is the one with the highest additionality to protect? Basically, what was the risk of deforestation the highest in the first place? So while you... we are waiting for the answers, uh, maybe I can ask you for a question that I've been asked uh, by, by the audience. Yes. Um, so the first one is, uh, World Economic Forum has launched one trillion tree initiative uh, to encourage global afforestation. However, some uh, climatologists say that having a trillion trees can do more ha uh, harm than good uh, as forests reach an equilibrium where they are carbon neutral. Can you please elaborate on this? Oh, yeah, I will I'll talk about this in the next slide, actually. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. okay, so we can. Okay, I'll, I will just share my screen then to have the results. Yeah. Can you see my screen? No, I, but I can't see your screen. Oh, yeah, okay, well. Um, so we have um, almost, yeah, we have 75% on C and 20% on A, it's moving. So let's say two thirds on C and 20% uh, on A, 70%, 90% on B. Mm -hmm. So it's more I'm or less sorry. equal between uh, between A and B, and uh, yeah, or more yeah. than sixty percent on C. I see. Um, so it's a little bit of a trick question, <laughs> and the trick question here is really so it makes sense to think about C as the highest at risk because it borders the farmland heavily, right? And it makes sense to I would have, for example, intuitively say B might be higher because if you look at the river, this provides more access to potential transportation of illegal deforestation. So uh, B could be a little bit higher than like this spot in A, where it's quite far away from the farmland. So that's that could have been like a reasoning, um, but A could also be like potentially the farmland here was a danger. So, but really we need to ask a little bit more and we need to ask something that is concerning the land use because C would be the highest deforestation risk, but only if it was not forced to be protected already. So for example, C could have been um, part of a national reservoir, right? With like legal enforcement already. So if you coming to a national park and say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna protect this, um, which has been already protected by, by the law, then, this is not really counting into additionality. So this is a, the land use it's, itself is something to concern as well. But even worse, potentially C could have caused more harm. Um, and that's something we call leakage, which is the fifth and uh, which is the fourth criteria of CAM credits. Um, how do you ensure that when you protect an area like C, for example, you're not actually leaking the deforestation around the area. And potentially that's actually what's happening here. Um, maybe the owner um, got paid for protecting C and then just cut the land around it, right? So you're basically not preventing any deforestation. You're just moving the problem from one place to the other. That's something called leakage, super hard to control. Um, and usually how what forest camp projects are doing, they are creating a leakage belt, like a, a approximate neighborhood to uh, make sure that this is not, uh, this is um, this is like a safety belt. The last one, which a lot of people basically cheat on, and so the highest one actually, is um, the baseline. Um, in order for, for 
these credits even get issued, you need to tell hypothetically what would have happened um, if my money would not, if these credits would not have been even issued, right? So basically what would have happened if this project would not have been started? And so this is a counterfactual, which you basically assume, and there are some machine models that just take, take in like the, not even machine model, you just take in the average like deforestation risk from a couple of um, years ago and you just extrapolate it and that's your baseline, the red thing. And the green one is basically then the, the project. Like, okay, this is what I think really I stored in because of my involvement, I planted more trees and without me planting the trees, it would have been this red line. So you can see this difference that's the credits issue, right? So um, th this is, um, these five criterias are meant to safeguard calm credits, but they do not. And as we've seen, for example, the, uh, the Guardian uh, article that I, I sent you to read, like more than 90% of rainforest calm offsets are, are worthless apparently to certain kind of like studies. And that is uh, relatable to mostly the baseline so th that people just had like ridiculous baselines. So I think um, one thing to to do quickly now is to have you listen to the sounds again, just quickly, so you know how a healthy forest sounds like. So this is what a wonderful and healthy forest sounds like. And I hope you, even though you couldn't listen to these sounds, you could have imagined it. And this is also what a forest sounds like. And this forest is actually next to the other forest. This is also the sound of the forest. Listen, oh, there's no light, no, no bird sound. And uh, maybe this truck that speaks once in a while, but like just quite like a, almost like a graveyard. And that is because this forest is not really a natural forest. This is a monoculture. So this forest is a, is a eucalyptus plantation next to the forest we hear with the bird sounds uh, that was solely planted for two purposes, either for carbon credits, because eucalyptus is one of the fastest growing trees in the world. Um, so it stores and sequesters these trees, really uh, these, um, the CO2 very, very fast, or for timber. And um, I think this this tries to answer the question that you asked before, right? Like if you just plant trees and you plant the tree and trees, if you plant the wrong species, if you plant it without safeguarding for the other metrics that the big circle I showed you in the beginning of the lecture, right? If you just focus on one simple metric, you're gonna harm the environment. So carbon credits actually without safeguards, without these measurements, without uh, considering the holistic picture, can potentially harm the harm climate environment. And that's why much pe many people have been criticizing the, the 1t.org um, campaign um, because of exactly that reason. So that was a lot of like knowledge about, on finance for nature. And so uh, let's talk about how artificial intelligence can help here. And you would have probably guessed it. Um, so all of that safeguarding, uh, measuring, monitoring, that sounds very data intensive, right? Very manual work. Unfortunately, forestry is one of these areas in the world that have been moving very, very slow. Um, but luckily we have an explosion of multimodal environmental data that has been coming over through the last years. So first of all, we have more advanced tools and field-based monitoring. So we have collected a bunch of like uh, through GPS, pictures, um, citizen science, lots of data on the ground on, on trees and nature and forest. Then, as Hannah already mentioned, we have a lot of amazing satellite-based monitoring um, that, uh, that is coming in. And we have also drone-based monitoring. Drones are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. At our nonprofit, for example, we use drones um, because they are so cheap. Um, you can get a really efficient drone that maps hectares of forest for less than like $400 already. And that can, that can map a lot of stuff. And a really amazing frontier right now is something we call environmental DNA monitoring, eDNA. 
that basically you sample the DNA of a leaf or a water, and then from that you can sequence and identify the species because the species leave traces of DNA like a, a, a person at a crime scene would leave that. And so that's really interesting. And we would argue that really here, um, the way to leverage this data, you, um, artificial intelligence is really uniquely suited to do so by fusing and learning from all, the, all this data using a multimodal environmental data. And that provides us with lots of new opportunities, but also challenges. <clears throat> so the, the quote here is basically that machine learning can really help us understand the location, health, and ecological value of forest, nature, and biodiversity at scale, not so much only just measuring the trees, and ensuring that these metrics are also reflected in policy, finance, and decision-making. So not just measuring, but also for action. So let's have a look how, from a top view picture again, how this forest carbon credit financing scheme looks like. So you have the landowner on the left. <clears throat> he basically protects and stewards the forest site in the middle. And he needs to hire this third party certifier to monitor and report how much impact he has, right? And this third party certifier provides a monitoring, reporting and verification that institutions then look at and they pay out the money if it's all good. So now with the increasing uh, availability of, for example, satellite data, one could first leverage remote sensing. So the satellite data could provide a public remote imagery of the same forest site. And then you can use remote sensing that could do many cool things in the forest. For example, deforestation forecasting, the subject I started the field with, land cover classification. You can also try to um, detect the deforestation drivers. As you can see in the satellite pictures, they look very different. You can try to do very, very cool things, frontier things like identifying the species of the tree or lots of people are doing that because of the carbon marketplace, estimating how much carbon is in the tree, is in the forest because of that satellite image. Another thing you can use AI for is machine assisted reporting. So that basically means increasing and lowering the fees of third party certifiers by replacing um, or enhancing manual work through mobile app, uh, machine learning based apps that can directly quickly measure and uh, identify tree species or um, allowing drones to fly and deploy sensors. And um, one really exciting way we believe AI can help is to actually completely get rid of the third party certifier and decentralize the whole monitoring, let the landowner, land steward um, leverage his communities, citizen scientists to collect data and then through that representation through these multiple layers of data that we have, we can create something that is very transparent, very trustworthy, and we don't need an expensive third party certifier. So let's talk about how we can leverage remote sensing for, for nature. So you've already seen this, but maybe this is something to, to really nicely look at side by side, is that we get a lot of like satellite data right now that are different kind of models, basically different kind of entities, different kind of satellites that are recording that data. On the very left side, you see Sentinel-2, which is a European Space Agency satellite that collects every five to 12 days, that's the revisit time of the satellite, takes a picture of any place in the world at a resolution of 10 meters per pixel. And this is how it would look like. And on the right side, this is the same place in Brazil, um, but from a commercial provider, Planet Labs, here, Planet Labs is three meters per pixel. Uh, Maxer, another commercial provider that provides the Google Earth images that can go up to 50 centimeters per pixel. You can see the differences in the, in the sensors, in the light. And um, one of the challenges here for machine learning is to handle these different sensors, to find the, uh, to basically map the different reference systems and to access the levels and temporal information to make sure that you learn a shared representation. And this can really, really increase um, machine learning in general. So for example, on the right, you see mangrove classification task. A mangrove is a forest type that grows close to coastal communities and areas. So it, it has much of its roots underwater. And on the, on the left side, you basically see the algorithm <clears throat> that is uh, only trained on satellite pictures. So here, three meters per pixel resolution. 
And then the top upper right picture is the result of a neural network that would have been only trained with satellite pictures. But if you are able to learn a shared representation and include, for example, drone imagery in it, um, and that's what this uh, paper from Higgs et al. showed, is that you can leverage these two satellite and drone image representations from the same area, and a neural network here, a small efficient net, can learn through its layers of shared representation and leverage better results. And you can see that on the right. So of course, for example, the <clears throat> of course the challenge is here to, to have enough labeled data. It's a supervised problem, but this is something you could use, for example, these kind of resolutions in. And you can even go one step further. <clears throat> Just drop the images and also try to include tabular data. Here, this is um, um, from Urban et al. Um, for SNET. And here, um, one important driver of deforestation is, and one important thing that distinguishes the drivers of deforestation is how close <clears throat> certain kind of social economic factors are around the area. For example, is it close to a road? Are there a lot of people living in? What's the elevation, right? At a certain kind of elevation, an area becomes very fertile and very good for crops and agriculture or palm oil. And in certain areas, it's not. So here you basically fuse in tabular data into, so you, you run a CNN, a convolution neural network. Um, you predict, uh, do a per pixel classification, and then you uh, infuse um, into a more shallower neural network the tabular data in to learn a shared representation and improve the prediction uh, at the final layer. And here it's a plantation, for example. One really cool thing that is uh, unexplored still <clears throat> because of its sheer size is that I, I just told you that the satellite are taking pictures every single day in terms of planet, every five to 12 days in terms of Sentinel. <clears throat> so we're talking about petabytes and petabytes and petabytes of data. And uh, much of that data is unlabeled. But you do see the structures of deforestation from a satellite really, really obviously. So, for example, in, in the Amazon, um, when someone deforests a large area in the Amazon, one of the first things you will see is a long road that goes through, that cuts through, in order to transport most of the forest uh, and trees out. And then you cut out side roads. So one big road and then several side roads. And from space, this looks like a fish bone, <clears throat> like a fish skeleton. And so we call it a fish skeleton structure. It's a very clearly represented, uh, like very obvious structure, but there's no labeled data. But the hope is that machine learning algorithms, just by looking at, looking and looking at lots of sequences of that data, can recognize the moment a fish bone structure could potentially evolve. And that's something we've done here. So we basically trained on a subset of um, South America. We queried a lot of the Landsat data, which is another uh, satellite um, with 30 meter per pixel resolution. And we basically gave a neural network past frames and forced it to predict future frames. So basically forced it to predict the evolution of forest cutting. And you can see here how on the top right, this is what actually happened. So um, this is the truth. And in the top, uh, and in the bottom right, you can see the predicted forest loss based on the prediction of how the forest will evolve. And it's not perfect, but it definitely gets the order right of where things are getting cut. So the challenge here is it's super difficult to train uh, every unsupervised learning algorithm is, and it needs a lot of computational resources. So that's, um, that's something to, to tackle with. Um, next, of course, if you move away from remote sensing, you have these machine learning based allometric estimation apps that are coming up. Here's one that our lab developed at ETH Zurich, where you can hold a, a credit card in front of a tree and credit cards are, um, are standardized in size all around the world. So a simple machine learning algorithm, a computer vision algorithm can just segment the bark and the card and from there get a quite a precise uh, estimate of the diameter. Um, and also we showed that using the bark itself, the bark oftentimes has a very unique structure. 
um, and texture, you can also get some information of a potential species here. The challenge here is um, that these models in to, to really make use and to really be efficient in the real world with real feedback needs to be low cost and oftentimes offline because these communities don't have stable internet access or even if they have inside the forest, you don't because of the trees. So that is a, that is a, a problem and collecting the data is still tedious. Um, that's why many communities have been, and including our nonprofit, has been looking into using drones to do the whole monitoring mapping itself. And drone data is kind of like super expensive satellite data, um, self-made. Basically, a drone image can get you a resolution of up to five to ten centimeters per pixel, meaning you can see now. You see the difference from the satellite image. You can now see the leaves, the leaf structure, the crown structure. And that's actually enough information for, for an expert labeler and for a machine or algorithm to detect the potential species of this tree. Of course, the problem is that uh, as for satellite data, we don't have a lot of limited, we don't have a lot of labeled data for, for any supervised classification tasks. So no one was sitting there and labeling like tree species from a drone image. This is a very recent development, but we believe that um, this, this could be a really, really great way to scale up all these efforts on monitoring. And these drones are also super useful for even the most, more sci-fi fancy stuff. So as we're moving more and more into, <laughs> into uh, drone drone based biodiversity measurements, we can see that these can also be used to access difficult terrain. Uh, here it attaches an um, audio moth into, into the tree branch to record sounds of the trees and actually is also able to remove that again. So this is work from my collaborator, um, Professor Minchev at the Environmental Robotics Lab in ETH Zurich, where he developed on top of a commercial Mavic uh, 2 mini drone uh, this very ori clever origami-like structure that allows you to attach sensors on the trees. And the difficulty, of course, like super difficult terrain. Machine learning is used to guide the drone, but um, this is still very cutting edge. And even more cutting edge, and that is imagery from just a month ago, um, is something that involves environmental DNA sampling and drones. So I mentioned very briefly in the AI section that one of the really new novel data developments that we've seen in the last decade only is the fact that we can sequence DNA traces on, on biological life. That means that we can drop something like a wet tissue that is attached to a drone from 60 meters height down into the canopy and it touches the leaves uh, while it's going through the canopy, and then you pull it up again, and from that wet tissue paper, you can extract the DNA, and you find out which leaves, which trees, potentially which animals that were sitting on these trees uh, are living close by. And you can measure something which by, by now has been really, really, really hard to measure, which is biodiversity, um, the species richness itself, which, again, if you cannot measure it, you cannot value it. But as you hear that from the sound of like a place that has no biodiversity. It is one of the most important things to measure. And we hope this this, this provides a, a novel way to do so. And potentially machine learning can help in multiple ways actually here to guide, for example, that drone to, to uh, stabilize uh, the line and to also just analyze and cluster the DNA results afterwards. On the left side, another way to extract DNA is to uh, filter it through water. This is, a, this is not like a tissue here on the left side. This is actually a, a, a big water pump that pumps and filters water through. And here uh, we discovered water um, in this small hole in the forest. And we dropped this very precisely, uh, no machine learning guidance into a pot, into a lake uh, and sucked the water out and then pulled it up again and dropped it um, with uh, with, um, and just carried it back to the to the station. So lots of lots of cool advancements of data, data modalities, how machine learning can be used. But um, one thing really we need to mention here is that there are limits to the computation centric approaches I just provided you with. 
And these limits are due to the fact of bias, due to the fact of the fact that we don't really understand these models yet. And these limits open up at the same time opportunities for local communities to get involved more deeply. So one study we did, for example, is we, um, we just wanted to understand how good are these satellite-based carbon estimation already algorithms that are trained on Sentinel-2 or like on Landsat. So we, um, together with WWF, we measured every single tree in Ecuador on six project sites, smallholder agroforestry sites. And we did the, the tedious thing. We basically calculated the species, measured the diameter at pressed height, and um, put it into an allometric equation and then accumulated the um, above ground biomass. And then we compared this with the satellite based predictions. And the satellite based predictions, we basically took the, that area, extracted the, the prediction map from Global Forest Watch, which is a very popular product that people use actually oftentimes to do carbon credits and uh, see how much they predict. And to our shock, actually, these satellite based estimations significantly overestimate um, above ground biomass density for these smallholder areas by a factor of like 10, right? Like in all six sites, except for site five, it was pretty okay. But all six sites are getting overestimated. And this first site getting overestimated by a factor of 10 is quite dangerous if you think about that this potentially means that this project has issued 10 times more CAM credits than it was supposed to have, right? And so here, the, the role, indigenous and local communities can play a really important role when it comes to uh, monitoring, reporting, verification. <clears throat> and two ways you can really involve them into your algorithm and development is participatory mapping. So you basically ask them for advice for input for additional data layer for your algorithms. And one way to study, for example, potential effects and behaviors of um, changes in land use and the policy governance is and run to strategy games where you allow them to um, play the role as a local community on the map. And they basically tell you exactly what kind of small things you have overlooked in just looking at the side image. For example, this land is owned by this farmer. He doesn't allow this other farmer to pass through. So paths are like walked around in different ways. So deforestation risk areas might be actually in other ways because the roads are not shaped as you would have expected them. And these are information you can, you can find out through those two kind of ways of data input. Um, one thing we pioneered um, in our lab is citizen science for conservation. Um, so we integrated several kind of chatbots into popular uh, servers like here at Discord server, where people can upload the drone image and um, a, a small tree gets segmented out and everyone from the world can just submit a label of this tree uh, from the convenience of their, of their chat server. So we had really great actually results on using these kind of citizen science for conservation, um, especially because they really allow us to not only include labels such as tree species, but also background information. For example, in one case during a competition in Singapore, we detected a species from a citizen scientist. He said, this is a Brazilian like nut tree in Singapore. And we are first stunned. This cannot be like, this is Singapore. What, what's like this Brazilian tree? What, what is the Brazilian tree doing in Singapore? But then he was like giving us all this background information of these beautiful five trees that have been once planted in Singapore in the national park and that evolved over time into this actually small colony of Brazilian trees in Singapore. So that's something you, it's really hard to get just from machine learning itself. Um, but one thing, for example, that is really interesting to see the indigenous role and how important it is to integrate indigenous knowledge into the core design of the algorithms and your models is here through that paper from Westerdahl. Here, he, he's trying to basically create new baselines. Um, so basically what you're seeing here is <clears throat> you're looking at um, 12 forest carbon credit projects. And the, the orange part here is the baseline. So basically the baseline is, again, what would have happened if there is no uh, forest carbon credit project? in this area. 
and the orange lines are all what these projects said what would have happened and you can see of course there's a huge deforestation loss the higher the more it gets deforested right and all of these getting deforested except for this one uh, project here um, and you can guess uh, which it is. It is this Suri project. And the Suri project is very famous in the sense that its baseline was actually modeled and developed together with indigenous communities. Uh, while the others were used, uh, you use average like average like historic deforestation loss, this project was uh, using uh, local knowledge as well. And it's actually the one project in that study that has properly predicted what would have happened if not, the blue ones is basically synthetic baselines, synthetic controls, um, a statistical way of finding out what would have happened if not, instead of just um, providing your own input. So um, to close up my lecture actually, um, and to go into the practical part, I want to show you the technology in action as well. Um, <clears throat> so, and this is really, really cool. <laughs> um, before I start the video, so this is, this is a video on um, the Rainforest X Prize, where my team and I we participated last month in in the X Prize, which is a competition of ten million dollars, a five year competition, and the competition basically asked us to monitor as many species as possible in the forest, as many biodiversity as you can get in one hundred hectares uh, within twenty four hours without entering the forest. So you're not allowed to enter the forest as a human. This is the rule. So you have to send your drones in, your robots in. And so we, we deployed these DNA samplers. And many of the species we then basically sampled out. And that's one of the beautiful things about this, this field of environmental DNA. Like you can match them to like animals, but up to 30 to 50% of the DNA you sample, uh, there is no existing match, um, which either means there's some error in the processing, when you sample the DNA, or it means that there are so much life out there that we have not yet discovered and measured yet. And probably both is true. And because there's so much life which doesn't have a name yet, so many animals that don't have a name yet, there's a, there's a cultural artistic movement that exists right now that um, translates the DNA sequence that we don't know the species name of into music notes to make it more um, reflective, more pregnant for, for us humans to remember the species. So this video has um, three different kinds of animals as music notes translated, which is like a cricket, a luminescent snail, and uh, a honeybee. So you can, you can just hear what, what DNA would look like when you basically translate that.
So yeah, this is basically how the technology would look like on the field where we deployed like the environmental DNA uh, technology. And yeah, I think with that, um, I'll close the lecture. Just some important words on the local community side. So it's really important to involve these local communities in the co-design of your impactful structure and technology because they are the main beneficiaries of your technology. So you need to make sure that you talk to them when you develop something, because otherwise you're developing on something that no one's gonna use. Um, so I'll skip that due to time and uh, just quickly mention, okay, um, yeah, the lessons learned over my career is basically that these algorithms that you develop for forests are some of the most impactful and powerful algorithms there is. Monitoring reporting verification is not about monitoring forests, it's about influencing human behavior. Because in the end, like your algorithm is gonna determine who gets money and who doesn't get. And so your algorithm and your data is influencing policy and can create dangerous feedback loops. So you really need to be sure that your algorithm is transparent, openly, and open and auditable. And it also has to be designed in, again, with, with local communities, you need to make sure that data ownership is talked about, make sure that scenario specific metrics are taken care of. And again, otherwise you're know, building tools that only satisfy us, but not no one else. And that field is beautiful in the sense that it's interdisciplinary. Um, Again, it's about human behavior. It's about modeling the real world. And oftentimes what you model and what you measure suddenly becomes, if that becomes a target, it doesn't become a good measurement anymore. That's good health law. And we've seen that a lot when we basically measure how many trees planted someone gets money off. Suddenly this is not the metric you want to optimize for. Carbon is not the metric you want to optimize for when this is the only metric you want to measure. So that's um, something that also reflects in the machine models, in the algorithms and in the technology we develop. Um, it needs to make sure and needs to address these potential pitfalls that are almost game theoretical. Um, with that, I'm closing the lecture and I'm open for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, David, for uh, this really interesting talk and for you for presenting your uh, really amazing uh, future and ongoing work. Um, we are a bit out of time, but I will ask you uh, a few questions. So uh, yeah, once again, we had a lot of questions on our platform, so we will go into them uh, after afterwards. Um, if I can ask one, uh, do you have any idea about SAR tomography uh, and how like SAR tomography can help uh, to uh, for a biomass estimation and deforestation management, for example? Sound? Like this is a question on sound? Oh, uh, it's like how 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 um, can we use like SAR tomography to better estimate biomass, for example, or uh, to better uh, manage or observe deforestation? Mm, so I'm not an expert in SAR tomography, um, um, so I I won't be able to tell it. Okay, okay, that's fine. Uh, we can we can skip this one. Um, so for the other one, how important is the ongoing management and protection of replanted forests versus just planting trees? Uh, are, there, um, are there projects using AI for this? Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, if you plant forests, you're going to have impact on the climate only after 50 years, 20 years, maybe even it's like five, you can, 10 years when it's eucalyptus, 50 years usually. So when you protect forests, your impact is instant because otherwise this, this CO2 would immediately go into the atmosphere, right? So you have impact that is instant versus impact that is delayed. We need impact that is instant first, and then we need impact that is delayed to sequester what damage we have done already. So that is always has been the priority we've seen. Um, but of course, when you claim you protect something, this is where most of the cheating happens. The, all the scandals happen on deforestation projects. Um, so this is something which is really difficult to assess. There are multiple companies that are using AI for both reforestation and deforestation prediction. Pachama is a good one that uh, take good out. Pachama is a famous one that basically uh, monitors the areas. Um, but you have also Silvera, that is a carbon credit rating company that claims to use AI algorithms to verify if that credit was properly adjusted or not. 
all these two companies, I have to say, they don't have the algorithms auditable. So we don't know anything about these algorithms. So I, it's hard for me to say if it's good or bad. And again, I just mentioned how important it is to really make these algorithms open because we're talking here about human behavior, dangerous feedback loops. So I'm a little bit concerned about this, um, but this is what it is. These are, many of these companies are doing this um, in this space. Okay, thank you very much for, for your answers. Um, I think we will close the talk now. Uh, like, thank you very much for, for being here today and for your great talk. Uh, and thank you for all uh, the attendees for, for being here. Thank you so much.